Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, North America's first place city. Today we're dealing with the second episode of our, of our tale of how religion has evolved here in, the, in Pensacola. Last time we left our story as the church uh, leadership and, uh, was locking the door and all of the parishioners and the, and the clergy itself were retreating as people fled from Pensacola as the, uh, the federal troops were about to occupy it in 1862. Of course, the war ended, and people slowly began to come back. And uh, naturally, the, one of the problems that they all had as they came back, there was a total, almost total absence of money, uh, trying to restore the churches, repair the, the damage that might have been done during three years of absence. This took place a step at a time, but happily, there was no serious damage to any of the churches except the Methodist Church on, uh, on Tarragona Street. That, and that, of course, was not a, a war casualty. It, it, the, uh, the damage, the, the destruction, the destruct of the little church occurred because some children began to play uh, alongside of it and somehow or other they either playing with matches or something like that they set a fire and the grass there uh, uh, was blown the flow of fire was blown through the grass it uh, attacked the church and it burned to the ground so the Methodists had to start over but by the time we move into the early part of the 1870s all of these churches are doing well now the Catholic Church which had never had a True, true church building of its own, finally had the funds together and they built, they built their own new church uh, very close to, uh, to the downtown plaza. But unfortunately, within just a couple of years, it burned. And so the story, uh, they, they went back to meeting once again in a warehouse. So we move into the 1870s and now things do begin to change. By the time we reach 1876, there is a small and growing Jewish community here. And these folks uh, come together, they, they, uh, they're pool of resources, and while they did not have the funding to employ a, a full-time rabbi, rabbi at the time, one of their members served in that role, and they built what we today would call the first version of Temple Bethel. This was built on the south side of Chase Street in the first block off of Palace Fox Street. The, the, the temple there was built uh, of wood. It served the, the congregation there into the uh, 1890s when fire destroyed that building and uh, it was replaced with a new brick uh, synagogue at the same site and that's uh, that synagogue again served in that particular location for 30 years when that, again fire attacked it it burned to the ground and the Jewish community built the the third version of Temple Bethel which still stands at the corner of uh, Cervantes and uh, Mobile Highway uh, four years later, something rather unique happened. Uh, a young man by the name of John Pfeiffer, whose family had been in Pensacola for the, oh, the last 45 years, was about to be married. And his bride was from Mobile. And so as they gathered for the, uh, for the prenuptial ceremonies over in that city, the, the pastor there asked John Pfeiffer, well, why don't you have a Lutheran church in Pensacola? And Pfeiffer said, well, I, I guess we've never quite gotten the act together. And so that was, the, that was the spark. And so these people organized, they raised funds, they purchased property, and that, that property was on the corner of uh, Garden Street and Balin, about where the Regions Bank parking lot is today. And they built a very lovely church there, and that served them for about 25 years when they chose to relocate and built their, the, uh, the new church, which is on the corner of Balin and uh, Wright Street. About the same time, the Methodists were beginning to have problems. This is now, this is now 1880. It's a very tumultuous time because the, uh, the lumbering era has begun, the railroad has been put in place, and Pensacola is a growing city. And the Methodist Chapel, the one that was rebuilt right after the war, uh, was on, on Tarragona Street, which of course was the direct line where the railroad, uh, railroad tracks ran from the railroad depot all the way down to the port. Now, I don't know what the, what the answer was, but the story, we, we wrote the, about that in this, this little book here that was done a few years ago for the Methodist Church. Uh, we examined, tried to find an answer of why, but we never did. But in some way, the, the leaders of the Methodist Church and the, and the, and the uh, engineers on the railroad became uh, at odds. And so basically what would happen was uh, on a Wednesday night during prayer meeting, by, by some rare coincidence, of course, a, a switch engine would arrive and park right outside the church. And while the service was in progress inside, the, the bell, the engine bell would ring, the whistle would blow, the steam would hiss out. And that was bad enough. And then, of course, the same thing would happen during Sunday morning services. And finally, the Methodists who felt, well, maybe 
we've outgrown this church, this little building anyway. They said, we're going to move. And so they, uh, they purchased what had been a chicken farm right on the corner of Palafox and Garden Street. And that was that where they erected their brand new, uh, beautiful brick church with a pastorium, which was just to the, uh, to the north of it. And of course, this was on the site which one day would become the San Carlos Hotel. Oh, okay. As all of this was going on, the, the Catholic Church finally was about to make a move. And at this point in time, the, of course, the, the city is now beginning to move north. The, the, uh, by the time we get to 1880, 81, 82, this is when North Hill begins to be populated, when uh, fine new homes are being erected. And a number of the, the Catholic parishioners, of course, are a part of that movement. And now the, 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 the priest at the time finally decided, well, it's, it makes no sense to build a new church down in the southern part of the city because the growth is going to be to the north. And so he arranged for the purchase of property north of where the Methodists had built their church. And this, of course, is on, on the Palafox Street at the corner of Chase. And uh, the story of how he did it, of course, is contained in this little booklet here. It, uh, it was a beautiful church. It was designed by a, an architect named uh, William Overman. And the, the, uh, uh, the construction was by the Turner Construction Company. And people at the time thought that the, the cost was outrageous because it cost $33,000 to build that church and of course, that beautiful St. Michael's Church is still in use today. The only difference today is that uh, it had been, it was stuccoed in between uh, 1885 and, uh, and the, the present time, so that the, out, uh, the, the exterior finish is different, but basically they have been true to, to uh, maintaining the, the uh, ambience that the original architect had, and it is a, a beautiful, beautiful church. Well, about the same time. Eight, just a year or so later, the Presbyterians felt they had outgrown their little church on Intendencia Street, so they went through the same kind of exercise. They, they sent a committee about, they, they studied how churches were being built in the South, and they purchased property on, uh, well, excuse me, that's not, not correct, they, they were given property by the, by the, the Simpson family on, the, on Chase Street, exactly across the street where Temple Bethel stood. And they, in 1887, they completed their church, which again is covered in this little story here, the story of the Presbyterian Church. It was a beautiful building. And uh, uh, of course, the Presbyterians uh, have a Scottish background, and they like to think that they do things with the f fiscal conservatism. Their church cost about $13,000 to build, and I suspect that the elders uh, drew their hands together thinking how much less it had cost them than it had the Catholics. Well, just a couple of years later, of course, the, uh, the Baptists uh, got into the same act. They uh, uh, purchased property up on the hill, just, be just below the, the height of Lee Square, and they erected their new church which would serve them well into the 1950s. At the same time, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, Episcopal Church people are beginning to get a little bit concerned. They said, we, we have got to do something because we've been, we've been down here in Old Christ Church for all these years. Our parishioners are moving north. We, we have to do something that's a little bit better. So they, they began to, to uh, uh, develop a, a search team. And this was, this was led primarily by Mrs. Henry Bars. She was the one that really was the, uh, the fiscal leader of this, the, the promoter of it. And they acquired property on the corner of uh, Wright Street and Palafox and built what the, what, the, what the church then, of course, called the New Christ Church. And indeed, it was put in place and first occupied for services in 1903. Now, while all of this has been going on, while the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, all of them have been building, another church came into being, which was extremely important here for for almost 30 years. That was built by a combination of the city of Pensacola, the, the city government, and the Norwegian government itself. In other words, by, at, by the time we get into the mid-1880s, our, our, uh, our lumbering era is at, in high gear, and there are something like 50 to 60 vessels a month coming in here to, to uh, pick up cargoes of lumber going to Europe. And most of those, not all, but most of those vessels were, were, uh, were handled by a, a crews of Scandinavian men, and virtually all of them were Lutheran. And now they, these people were here not just a day or two, as which might be the case in, in modern day shipping. They would, might be here two, three, four weeks uh, in, the, in the transit of the, uh, discharging the, the ballast and then loading a new cargo. 
So these men needed a home away from home. And so the, the Norwegian government and the city of Pensacola cooperated and built what was known as the Norwegian Seamen's Church. It was on South Palafox Street, about a block and a half up from the waterfront. It was a lovely church. It unfortunately burned once in the course of its life, but was rebuilt uh, and enlarged somewhat. And it was, a, it was totally successful as a home for these, for these many seamen. And it has one, one tradition that we want to recall in it. This was certainly unique. Uh, but after a few years, they, the, uh, the process for, for these men uh, erected, uh, developed so that people at, back home knew where these men were going to be for Christmas. And so any little Christmas gift that they wanted to send would be sent in care of the Norwegian Seaman Church. And two nights before Christmas, there would be a grand celebration in the church and, the, and the town, our town's leadership and the city government would, would be there to help. It was a wonderful, they'd have a, a big dinner down there, the men would the seamen would open their presents, and then after they were finished, these men would walk back down to the waterfront, get in their ship's boats, they would put lanterns on them, and they would begin to row back and forth along the waterfront, singing their native Christmas carols. And of course, the whole town would turn out to see it, and this, uh, this was a custom that endured here for almost 20 years. And as far as I know, it's the only place in the whole United States where such a, a custom proceeded. Well, the, uh, as we move toward the, uh, the beginning of the 21st century, the, uh, the movement into North Hill and a little bit into East Hill was beginning. And so at that point in time, a, a group from the Methodist Church felt that they, were, they needed to have something a little more convenient for themselves. So with the, with the assistance of the uh, Methodist Conference out of, uh, out of the Carolinas, they obtained permission and then funding, and they built what they called a Sunday school on the east side uh, along 9th Avenue. Avenue, just off of Ninth Avenue, and they used that, of course, as a Sunday school. And of course, when the when the uh, the Board of Education saw this, they said, "Well, that's only being used a few hours on Sunday. Could we use this as a school?" And so they kind of cooperated together. And ultimately, uh, after just a year or so, uh, it went be beyond being a Sunday school and was was classified as a church. A new building was built on the corner of Jackson and Ninth Avenue, and this became the Jackson and, and uh, Gadsden, and this became the Gadsden Street Methodist Church which, of course, uh, is still with us today. Now, about the same time, other churches were beginning to go into what we would today call the missionary movement. Uh, the Presbyterians, for example, began to put together what we would call Sunday schools. And these were, they were at, they were at Millview, at Muskogee. Uh, one was built down on the waterfront for sailors. And uh, this movement was, was very successful and ultimately led to the, the uh, foundation, the creation of a new Presbyterian church uh, on the east side. And this ultimately became the McElwain Presbyterian Church. It had several names before that, Knox Presbyterian and others, but it was the direct out for, uh, outgrowth of the Sunday School missionary movement that took place that way. About the same time, many of these churches, of course, uh, took up the, the, the idea of foreign missions. And a number of the men who were, who were uh, uh, clergy in all of these churches about this time became very much involved in the missionary movement itself. Now, at the turn of the, 21st, uh, the 20th century, we had, we had here about 30 churches altogether. Now, the many beyond the ones that I've described in the, these two episodes, there were 17 that were uh, for white uh, uh, parishioners and 12 that were for, uh, for uh, colored, and they were all very successful at the time. And as, as time has gone forward, of course, this, this whole thing has, has evolved in many, many different ways. As the community has grown, the churches have grown. Today, if you pick up your, uh, your current telephone book and went back and go back to the, the element, the segment there called churches, you're going to find not just 25 or 30 church lists, you're going to find literally hundreds there, and there are many others that are so small that they do not have a, a directory listing. But basically, the, the evolution of religion has been part of our story from beginning to end. There have been, there have been peaks and valleys, as, such as I mentioned earlier with the Oxford movement, and uh, where, what we are going through today, well, we can't d describe yet whether it is another peak or a valley, but nonetheless, the church has been with, it, it, with us all the way through, a, gr a great source of comfort, and in di difficult times, uh, helped so, so much with the poor. That is our story of religion.